are all dominated by electronic media, for the most part, it's a one-way process. But it shouldn't be a one-way process any more than any means of communication should be one way. So what we're trying to do in Access is to give millions of ordinary people the right to use this vehicle to speak with each other. <laughs> Ordinary people can make interesting, important television if we're given a chance. And now, recipe for repression. First, stir up fears about an uncertain future. Then, heat with accusations of obscenity. Make sure to silence artists and others whose views are controversial. Serve immediately. For our next course, Government Issue Morality, it's a long way from Apple. <laughs> why do people in Davis, California watch Deep Dish television? I don't know. I don't know why. why do we watch people Deep Dish? I don't know. I don't know why. Because it, it keeps us on top of things. Stay tuned. Four more. Deep Dish TV. I was born in, into a, a small family in a town called Aguas Buenas in the mountains of Puerto Rico. And I'm a member of the Creek tribe, or Muscogee is the name, our name for ourselves. I was born in the middle class, or perhaps the upper middle class, but my father died when I was five. The depression hit hard. We, we moved from a series of uh, pretty nice places to not so nice places to lousy places. A very important um, a figure in my, in my family, in my, in, in my life, was, was my grandfather, who was a, a maker of cigars. He, he worked in a place that we call a chinchal, which is a tobacco workshop. It is tradition with the tobacconists in the Caribbean and in Spain that they read literature when they work. They have a, actually have a reader come in and read to them from the great literature of the world. And so um, they uh, were men of, of, of great language and, of, uh, uh, and the great debates took place in this small little place that I as a child was like crawling around uh, amongst the tobacco leaves and listening to and seeing the pages of a book turn. I was enormously aware of this, this eroding of, of the world. And uh, and I saw one of my functions as uh, as a repository of the of, of, of all these people around me too, who by the time uh, you know I was 25, many of them had died, and they you know if they lived, they lived here or here. And I'm from Oklahoma, but originally my people weren't from Oklahoma. We're from the southeastern part of the United States. In fact, the Creek Confederacy covered much of the southeast, but particularly Georgia and Alabama. And my family is from Alabama. And uh, thanks to Andrew Jackson, who was looking for, you know, he's a land developer. <laughs> he wanted a land for his relatives. Uh, and I have a, a great grandfather, a great great grandfather, who led the one of the who was one of the leaders of the Red Stick War, who fought Andrew Jackson against this move, but wound up in Oklahoma anyway. Anyway, what I'm getting to is that when I went to New Orleans for the first time, it was the closest I had come to those homelands. 
And uh, so when I, I walked around New Orleans trying to figure out what happened, trying to find pieces of the story that I hadn't been able to figure out in Oklahoma. And um, I walked to the Mississippi River and sat there for a long time. And I started remembering the story that I had heard in elementary school in history about this guy named DeSoto. And what I remember, which may not be what happened, is that there was a Spanish explorer who was looking for gold. And anyway, the, he wound up in the southeastern part of the United States. And he was either killed and his body thrown in the Mississippi River or he was drowned. And I think it was the Choctaws or Chickasaws who did it. But in this poem, I used my poetic license and I said the Creeks did it. So I figured they must have had something to do with it if they knew he was wandering around. New Orleans. This is the South. I look for evidence of other creeks, for remnants of voices, or for tobacco brown bones to come wandering down Conti Street Royale or Decatur. Near the French market, I see a blue horse caught frozen in stone in the middle of a square. Brought in by the Spanish on an endless ocean voyage, he became mad and crazy. They caught him in blue rock, said, don't talk. I know it wasn't just a horse that went crazy. Nearby is a shop with ivory and knives. There are red rocks. The man behind the counter has no idea that he is inside magic stones. He should find out before they destroy him. These things have memory, you know. I have a memory. It swims deep in blood, a delta in the skin. It swims out of Oklahoma, deep the Mississippi River. It carries my feet to these places, the French Quarter, stale rooms, the sun behind thick and moist clouds, and I hear boats hauling themselves up and down the river. My spirit comes here to drink. My spirit comes here to drink. Blood is the undercurrent. There are voices buried in the Mississippi mud. There are ancestors and future ch children buried beneath the current stirred up by pleasure boats going up and down. There are stories here made of memory. I remember De Soto. He is buried somewhere in this river. His bones sunk like the golden treasure he traveled half the earth to find. Came looking for gold cities, for shining streets of beaten gold to dance on with silk ladies. He should have stayed home. Creeks knew of him for miles before he came into town. Dreamed of silver blades and crosses, and knew he was one of the ones who yearned for something his heart wasn't big enough to handle. And De Soto thought it was gold. The Creeks lived in earth towns, not gold. Spun children, not gold. That's not what De Soto thought he wanted to see. The Creeks knew it and drowned him in the Mississippi River so he wouldn't have to drown himself. Maybe his body is what I am looking for as evidence to know in another way that my memory is alive. But he must have got away somehow because I have seen New Orleans, the lace and silk buildings, trolley cars on beaten silver paths, graves that rise up out of soft earth in the rain, shops that sell black mammy dolls holding white babies, and I know I have seen De Soto having a drink on Bourbon Street, mad and crazy, dancing with a woman as gold as the river bottom. It's, it's curious how you learn, you know, something comes at you sideways. And it's like writing about all the factory stuff. All that came out of a dream, believe it or not. I was about... 35, 34, I had this dream that a guy, a black guy I'd worked with in Detroit named Eugene Watkins called me on the telephone, he was in Bakersfield, California, and said, and this guy had, this guy had an awful wife, I couldn't stand his wife, so I never wanted to be around him that much after work, so we'd gone, you know, to the movies a couple times, and this wife, oh God, she was awful. 
So he calls me from Bakersfield in the dream. And clearly what he wants is to say, come to Fresno, blah, blah, blah. And I tell him, oh, you're in Bakersfield. you got to go to L.A. You, when you get to L.A., you got to see this. And I'm telling him to see things he can't possibly afford to see. And to go to art museums he would give a shit about. And then then, then drive up the coast. And when you get to San Francisco, you got to go here and you got to go here. And oh, thank you, Phil. And then, you know, like in a dream, I can actually see him in the phone booth with the car parked there and the wife and the two kids. <laughs> and, and I hang up in the dream. And then I wake up. And I said, oh, you're such an asshole. You know, I mean... You know, and here I'm living, I'm actually living in a working class neighborhood in Fresno, and I'm saying, well, what, I don't want Eugene Watkins from Detroit, the black guy and his black wife, and, but to come, and, you know, if my neighbors, there's going to be, and who are my neighbors? They're Chicanos anyway, big deal, as though they could care. And I'm getting mad at myself. And then I, it dawned on me, hey, I didn't do this. It was a dream. I mean, I didn't actually do it. It was a dream. It was a warning. Don't do this. Don't turn your back on all those people who were your life. Sweet Will. The man who stood beside me 34 years ago this night fell onto the concrete oily floor of Detroit transmission. And we stepped carefully over him until he wakened and went back to his press. It was Friday night, and the others told me that every Friday he drank more than he could hold and fell, and he wasn't any dumber for it, so just let him get up at his own sweet will, or he'll hit you. <laughs> at his own sweet will was just what the old black man said to me. And he smiled the smile of one who is still surprised at dawn graying the cracked and broken windows could start us all to singing in the cold. Stosh rose and wiped the back of his head with a crumpled handkerchief and looked at his own blood as though it were dirt and puzzled as to how it got there and then wiped the ends of his fingers carefully one at a time the way the mother wipes the fingers of a sleeping child and climbed back on his wooden soda pop case to his punch press and hollered at all of us over the oceanic roar of work, addressing us by our names and nations, nigger, kike, hunky, river rat. But he gave it a tune, an old tune like America the Beautiful. And he danced a little two-step and smiled, showing the four stained teeth left in the front and took another suck of cherry brandy. In truth, it was no longer Friday. For night it turned to day as it often does for those who are patient. So it was Saturday in the year of 48 in the very heart of the city of man where your Cadillac cars get manufactured. In truth, all those people are dead they have gone up to heaven singing time on my hands or begin the begin and the Cadillacs have all gone back to earth and nothing that we made that night is worth more than me and in truth I'm not worth a thing but with my feet and my two bad eyes and my one long nose and my breath of old lies and my sad tales of men who let the earth break them back each one to dirty blood or bloody dirt. Not worth a thing, just like it was said at my magic birth when the stars collided and fire fell from great space into great space and people rose one by one from cold beds to tend a world that runs on and on at its own sweet will. I grew up in the Puerto Rican communities of New York City, which uh, we, we grew up with a kind of a, a, a black English uh, and Puerto Rican New York City slang. It's, I mean, you'd have to hear it to see it or feel it to believe it, but that's that's what it was, you know. 
Art this, art that, art this, art you, art this, art this. Lucy Comancho is an artist, art this. She makes all the stars in Hollywood seem like flashlights which have been left turned on for a week. She had a friend in C, a friend in C, a friend in me with paintings and blowing things up into color which came from nowhere. No one knows where she got these things. Her mother says too much thinking. She painted the walls in her house. She painted the hallways and stairs, the stoops, the garbage can tops, the squares in the sidewalk, the tar on the street, the plastic bags from the cleaners, the brown grocery bags, the inside of milk containers. She herself had to be contained from painting your face, the, lower, the closest layer of the sky, elements, everything. She gave brush to rush to paint your nalgas if you gave her room. She never thought of canvas where they sell it, absent for, from her view. Sometimes she was called Picasa, feminizing Picasso. She painted Josefina, as I was writing that Josefina is the feminine of Jose. Jose's who are also known to go under the nickname of Cheos or Pepe's. And so Josefina got tagged on her the name Pepa, which is female for Pepe, and she dug that Pepa. For if you look close, the other name Jose Ifina means Jose and Thin, or sounds like Oficina, like Ho Jose Office. Also, it has something in it of Jose is Fina, Jose is Finish, Finish. Know this for someone being composed by an artist. <laughs> to top it off, Pepa also means pit. You see what is inside of fruits? This is all in Spanish and something is being lost in the translation. Just like you lose your natural color when you leave a tropical country and come to a city where the sun feels like it's constipated. Ask Lucy Comancho. She knows about all this. Artists, art that, art what, artus, art moose. This next poem I wrote for anime Pictou Aquash. I wrote it for a memorial, memorial for her. She was a young Mi'kmaq Indian woman who was very, very active in terms of Native rights, um, especially in the, well, the mid-70s, well, all her life, really, all her life. And um, in February of 76, a, uh, well, she had been missing for a while, and she had been warned by a particular FBI agent that if she kept doing her work, that she would, be, she would die for it. And, uh, but that didn't stop her, but she had let people know, her lawyer for one, you know, about this threat. <coughs> well, in February 1976, a uh, Lakota rancher up on the Pine Ridge Reservation was out um, taking care of his fences and found the body of a young woman out there. Well, the FBI were on the scene immediately, as were the BIA police. And they took her in and um, did it. The coroner did an autopsy on her and said that she died. That I guess he was heard to say that she was just another drunk Indian who died of exposure. And with those words, they buried her as un unnamed. But before that, um, you know, they needed before that they needed fingerprints. And I suppose if the body has suffered some decomposition or you know is at that state, what they'll do is shave off the fingertips and send those to the FBI to the FBI uh, office, but what they did in her case was they cut her hands off, which was totally uncalled for, mm -hmm. and nailed them to the FBI. And then on, with those words and with that action, they buried her. But word got around, and people hadn't, she had been missing for a little while, since after around Christmas, and so people thought, you know, that might be Annie Mae. And uh, so her lawyer and others, other people in the community had them, her body exhumed and with another coroner who was not working for the BIA and found out that she had not died of exposure, but she had died of a small caliber gun wound at the back of her head, which the first coroner accidentally missed. Anyway, I wrote this poem for a memorial for her, and uh, it's called For Anime Picked to a Quash, Whose Spirit is Present Here and in the Dappled Stars, For We Remember the Story and Must Tell It Again So We May All Live. Beneath the sky blurred with mist and wind, I am amazed as I watch the violet heads of crocuses erupt in the, from the stiff earth after dying for a season, as I have watched my own dark head appear each morning after entering the next world to come back to this one amazed. 
It is the way in the natural world to understand the place the ghost dancers named after the heart-breaking destruction. Anime, everything and nothing changes. You are the shimmering young woman who found her voice when you were warned to be silent or had your body cut away from you like an elegant weed. You are the one whose spirit is present in the dappled stars. They prance and look like colored horses who stay with us through the streets of these steely cities, and I have seen them nestling the frozen bodies of tattered drunks on the corner. This morning when the last star is dimming and the buses grind toward the middle of the city, I know it is 10 years since they buried you, the second time in Lakota, a language that could free you. I heard about it in Oklahoma or New Mexico, how the wind howled and pulled everything down in a righteous anger. It was the women who told me, and we understood wordlessly the right meaning of your murder. As I understand ten years later, after the slow changing of the seasons, that we have just begun to touch the dazzling whirlwind of our anger, we have just begun to perceive the amazed world that ghost dancers entered crazily, beautifully. I guess I should say that they have a saying, or I was told this, that up on uh, up in uh, that the Lakota people had a saying that when someone has been murdered and is um, buried that um, the wind comes up and the wind was so bad they said they had to change the place where the wake was being held because the wind was blowing the building down. The poem grew out of going back to Detroit in uh, after uh, the great what we called in Detroit the Great Rebellion of 1967 when so many people rose up and burned portions of the city. In a, an extraordinarily powerful and honest statement about their disgust at, at the racism which determined both American foreign policy then in Vietnam and American domestic policy in the cities of the United States. And I went back to the city shortly thereafter, and I went back to the neighborhoods where this had taken place, which were the neighborhoods in which I'd grown up, and I discovered something nuts, but obvious. I was the enemy. I was middle-aged and pretty much middle class, and I was white. And I had this enormous uh, complex of emotions that had to do with the awe of this powerful statement and the fear of being unwanted and perhaps hated. And out of those emotions came this poem called They Feed, They Lion. They Feed, They Lion. Out of burlap sacks, out of bearing butter, out of black bean and wet slate bread, out of the acids of rage, the candor of tar, out of creosote, gasoline, drive shafts, wooden dollies, they lie and grow. Out of the gray hills of industrial barns, out of rain, out of bus ride, West Virginia to kiss my ass, out of buried aunties, mothers hardening like pounded stumps, out of stumps, out of the bones need to sharpen and the muscles to stretch, they lie and grow. Earth is eating trees, fence posts, gutted cars, Earth is calling in her little ones, come home, come home from pig balls, from the ferocity of pig driven to holiness, from the furred ear and the full jowl, come the repose of the hung belly, from the purpose they lie and grow, from the sweet glues of the trotters, come the sweet kinks of the fists. From the full flower of the hams, the thorax of caves. From bow down, come rise up. Come they lion from the reeds of shovels. The grained arm that pulls the hands, they lie and grow. 
from my five arms and all my hands, from all my white sins forgiven they feed, from my car passing under the stars they lion, from my children inherit, from the oak turned to a wall they lion, from they sacked and they belly opened, and all that was hidden burning on the oil-stained earth, they feed they lion, and he comes. Uh, I'm not interested in writing a political poem directly as perhaps Neruda has written or is a political conscious poet directly. Being, for instance, a person that was involved with the Communist Party of Chile that he ran for president or something in, in Chile uh, uh, on the ticket of the Communist Party, um, I sort of... Um, can, can contribute towards social consciousness indirectly. If I write a poem about uh, the fact that I don't like the way they make coffee in, in North America, I am beginning to take a very pro-Puerto Rican nationalist position, as far as I'm concerned. But some people might not see that right away. So a lot of my poetry brings out the great qualities of our Criollo Caribbean culture in storytelling, in music, in mysticism, in spiritism, and I use that all in the energies and in the content and in the circumstances of my poem. And by doing so, I am just positioning the worlds, and in doing so, I am showing how a very strong and valid Hispano Antillian culture must be preserved must not be North Americanized. We must not lose the gracious language of English, of Spanish rather, in our island. And um, uh, this is the way that I fight, and this is the way that I contribute towards the bettering, the betterment of uh, the circumstances of the humanity that I come from. An evening on the river Ganges, in India, of the East. My body was dividing the air along with the others. We were on mission sacred. The sun was through silk like water through coffee beans. It was like cold coconut milk down infernal throat as if to see Satan running on fire chased by peeled mangoes, throwing juice, and what's better than that was the appearance after disappearance, ah, lovely brown feet with bells and red-blue beads and sofas of paradise with pillows you can sit on, a kitchen there for flavor and no tongue to suck but the blueprint of the sucking. It was a drink of rays with yoga as each bone went home with fish and shrimp and burukena, English crab, not even blue blood New England nobility can reach the day of the saint. With sitar running up spine, philosophic, philosophic embrace of people dancing beyond their meat, diving and bolting out like electric wet, with symbols, pirates, mothers, gypsies, and give pleasure later after the rapture, grazing with moisturizing looks that kings sent for, collapsing, fainting in front of the flow, I call her name. I call her name as the fragrance of coffee awakes me into the Aguas Buenas morning, where across the street, my grandfather, Julio El Bohemio, made cigars once and thus forever.
Yes. Yeah.